All right, so we've been doing this study on being anchored, and um, as we, we consider being anchored, I think it's important to make sure that we have the proper anchor and that we are tightly secured. And so we've been talking about being anchored to Jesus, anchored to the Word. Um, we're going to spend a couple weeks, um, two or three or four, I'm not sure yet, on prayer. And as we um, consider prayer today, there's a lot of um, false teaching on prayer, and, and there's a lot of um, misconceptions about prayer. And so what I want to do today is think about our posture. And by posture, I don't mean how you're standing or how you're kneeling or how you're sitting, but our attitude and, and, and what our attitude towards prayer is and understand um, kind of the concept of how God taught us to pray um, and the, the basics of that. Um, when you think about faith, faith is another one that gets um, all messed up. And so there are those that teach that it's all about how much faith you have and how big your faith is, and you can do anything you want to do, and you can make God do anything you want Him to as long as you have big enough faith. That's wrong. You know, it's not as much how much faith you have as who your faith is in. And, and, I, and, I, and I can tell you from experience, I can tell you from the Word, and I can tell you that most of you have similar experiences, that sometimes God moved the greatest when you felt like you had the weakest faith. But you were putting your faith in Him. And, and, and that's the key. And I think as when we, when we think of prayer... How many of you have gone through that where you're, you're intimidated to pray because you don't have as good of words? You, 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 don't, you don't say it as good as some of these other pastors or teachers do or some of these um, exalted saints. And so many times we get intimidated. And, and you know, it's not about having the exact words. It's not about having um, the best words. It's about being honest and truthful with God and, and really knowing who God is. Does that make sense? I think sometimes we, we think, well, and, and I've seen the books, you know, 21 ways to write your ticket with God, you know. It's not about having a uh, procedure, you know, if, if I were to do a test today and ask you how many of you um, know the Lord's Prayer. Word for word, 90% of everybody in here would be able to do the Lord's Prayer. But the problem I see is that a lot of people know what the words are, but they don't know what the meaning is. And, and that's, that's an issue. And when, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he didn't say, say these exact words and you'll get everything you want. He said, pray in this manner. Pray, pray in this heart. And so as we look at this today, that's what I want to go over and kind of get us on the same page prayer-wise and then start looking at some of the different prayers in the Bible. Sound good? Anchor to Jesus. So we're going to look at a, a recap, anchoring to Jesus. Number one, it's interesting because Jesus says, if you love me, then I will give you everything you want. Your life will be perfect. No bad things will happen, right? Some people are teaching that. You won't get that here. The Bible actually says, Jesus says, if you love me, if you really love me, it's not about the bumper sticker that says, I love the Lord. It's about if you love me, then you'll obey my commands. There's a lot of people that say, that they love the Lord, but they refuse to go to church, refuse to read the Bible, refuse to pray, and they refuse to tithe, and they refuse to fellowship, and they refuse to clean up their language, and they refuse to do the things, the simple things that Jesus said. And so as we think about it, how, how many of you have ever had this conversation with one of your kids Who do you think you're talking to? 
Any, any takers? How many of you got backhanded a few times when you say, you know, said something and your parents said, oh, time out, who do you think you're addressing right now? Think, think about it. Think about it. If you, know, if you know all the right words to say, and you're completely defying God and won't do what he says, do you think he's just going to do what you want him to because you're saying the right things? How many of you have one of those manipulative um, family members that know that they can do the wrong thing, and then when they get in trouble, they're going to say like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I love you. I love you. You're, you're my favorite. I love you. How many of you, as soon as those words start coming out, you're like, Because it's just manipulation. And, and when you don't follow the rules, the person that makes the rules isn't going to be real happy with you. True? Amen. How many of you parents set rules? If you didn't set rules, you're a bad parent. Um, you, you set rules, and you expect those rules to be obeyed, correct? And you have every right to make the rules. Now, how many of you, when, you're, when your kid or grandkid or great-grandkid comes in and breaks the rules, you still love them just as much as you did before they broke the rules, but you ain't happy with them at that point? And you're not willing to do the things that they want you to because there's been a violation of that relationship because they've broken the rules. Right? Jesus said... And if we're going to be anchored to Jesus, then we've got to listen to what he says. And he says, if you really love me, then you're going to obey what I say. You're going to obey my commands. And there's churches right now, there's churches that says, well, if you're saved, there's no commandments anymore. Well, wait a minute. Jesus must not have got the memo. Or, or the churches aren't going by the word of God. You see, being anchored, being anchored means you're anchored to the right thing, not the wrong thing. John 8, 31 says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you keep obeying my teachings. And then you will know the truth because you've been obeying my teachings. You've known my teachings, so therefore you can obey them. And then you will know the truth and the truth will really set you free. Remember the other verse that says, if the Son, Jesus, sets you free, wow, you're truly free. Free indeed. Some people think they're free, but they're not. Colossians 2 verse 6 says, and now just as you accepted Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to live in obedience to him. Now, see, the Bible says when we start doing what Jesus says, then we're going we're gonna to know his perfect will, and we're going to know how perfect it really is. But that won't happen until we start obeying. So now, anchored to the word, Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The New Living says heaven and earth will disappear. There's, there's actually teachers teaching that heaven and earth won't ever pass away, and yet the Bible says. Now, 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 here's the thing. We're trying to anchor to the Word of God, and the Word of God says everything around you at some point is going to pass away. Everything that you know is going to cease to exist except the Word of God. So how important now is the Word of God? That makes it, like, way elevated. We, we, call it, we call it the Holy Bible. So it's a sacred book. And yet, is it sacred enough to live by? See, see the, the funny thing, there's this, there's this pastor that um, he does a lot of weird things, um, off-the-wall things to get people's attention. And... The funny thing is, 
last week in church, he, he took his Bible and he poured a whole bunch of chocolate syrup on it and then covered it in whipped cream. And a whole bunch of people got really upset with him because he desecrated the Bible. And yet, most of the people that got upset with him aren't living by it anyways. So is it just a sacred artifact? Or is it a living book that we should live by? Does that make sense? Sometimes we look at it as it's just an object instead of this is God's word. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything. So everything that exists, everything that man has um, done is all based out of what God made. Makes him pretty important. Makes him pretty intelligent. Makes him pretty um, in charge. Ownership, right? He created it. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. God gave his approval to people in days of old because of their faith. So it's talking about faith, faith, faith. And then it says, by faith, we understand. By faith, we have this comprehension that what we now see, heaven and earth, everything that's on it, what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. So it goes on and it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith tells us, the word of God tells us that God spoke everything into being. So in other words, God didn't have to have anything to create the heavens and the earth. He just said, earth be and earth was. So he, he spoke it into being. See, if, if we were going to make something, we'd have to get a bunch of things and a bunch of parts and put it together, and he could just say it. Faith, we understand that. If we have the faith, and how do we get the faith? We anchor to the word, and we know the word. We hear the word, and we hear the word, and we hear the word. Some, sometimes people say, and it's usually younger people that say, why do you keep having to say that over and over again? Now, for us that are of a certain age, why do we have to keep saying it over and over and over again? So that it sinks in, and it becomes part of us, and as we consider ourselves, why do we need to hear it over and over and over again? Because that's the only way we're going to remember it, right? So as we think about this, God was smarter than us, and before we were ever in existence, he told us that faith comes from hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. Verse 6 of chapter 11 of Hebrews says, So you see... It is impossible to please God without faith. So you have to have faith to please God. How do you get faith? Hearing the word of God. Why do we come to church? Hear the word of God. Why do we sing the songs? Hear the word of God. How many of you, if I were to name like, like brands or companies, you would be able to recite their jingle? Right? How many of you, if we did a test right now, we could all sing the Big Mac song word for word without missing a beat? How many of you remember the original um, jingle for Burger King? Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders. Right? Don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us have it your way or serve it your way. Right? Right? See? Now why? Now, now why 
can we sing the Big Mac song that they probably haven't had for, well, I won't say how long, but it's been a while, right? How come, how come we don't remember what we ate yesterday, but we remember the Big Mac song? Because we heard it, and we heard it, and we heard it every single time we watched a TV show. Every, you know, it's like, have you noticed um, some of these newscasts? They're 30 minutes long. They have five minutes of news, and they say, next up, we're going to tell you about. And then they have six commercials that brainwash you to buy their product or agree with their, you know, product. And why do we teach kids songs? How, how many of you, how many of you, if, if I were to do a test and we go through um, the books of the Bible, you couldn't do it. But... If I start singing the books of the Bible, you're going to know every single one, right? Hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing, and there's something about music. So when we come into church, we sing. Why do we sing? Not to, not to make you feel better, but to get it inside of us. So we remember it and we, we live it, right? That's why it's really important what we listen to. How many of you remember the song, you know, be careful little ears what you hear, right? Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that there is a God and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So God wants to reward you, but he's going to reward you when you seek him, not the reward. R right? Right? It's not, it's not, well, okay, I'll do this for you as long as you pay me. This is, this is God, I want you. And then an extra benefit of that is that he rewards you. So, so priority, priority, God says that we have to search for him. It says in, in John 15, 16, and, and these are all really important verses. You did not choose me. How many of you, when I found God, when I chose Jesus, well, before you were ever even created, God chose you. It says, I chose you, and I gave you this work to go and produce fruit, fruit that will last. So when you, when you talk about being saved, when you talk about being a believer, when you talk about being a Christian, it's about God chose you, and you realized it and accepted that choosing, and now part of that choosing is he's got a plan for you. It says that you'll produce fruit, and then, and then, when you're producing fruit, when you're doing what he wants, then the Father will give you anything you ask in my name. There's a whole lot of people saying that they want everything they ask for, but they're not seeking God. They're just seeking the things. And they're not living for God, right? They're not producing the fruit. They just want God to be their bellhop. And then he says, this is my command, love each other. So the first command is loving each other. Do you realize that when God chose you, he chose you to be in his family, not a loner that does your own thing and keeps saying that you love God and love people? Do you realize you can't show love for people if you're not with people? Sometimes it's easier that way. How many of you know at least, at least one person in your family that the comment has been made, it's way easier to love you from a distance? 
And some people, some people are a lot easier to love than others, true? But see, God, he goes a step further, and he says, don't just love the people that you like. Don't just love the people that are good to you. Even go as far as love your enemy. Wow. Don't like that verse. And, and you'd be amazed how many enemies are within the body of Christ. But when you're actually loving your enemy, then are they really still an enemy? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Long ago, long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. He chose us to be holy. The Bible says, be holy even as I, God, am holy. So should your lifestyle be like this or should your lifestyle be like this? You see, God chose you, but he didn't chose you to let you do whatever you want. He chose you to be holy. How many of you have ever, um, you've ever gone to um, like a wedding or a special event and you take kids with you and you chose their clothes and your, and your choice was based on this. You wanted them to be clean and well-dressed, right? And so you expected them to go through the event clean and well-dressed. You didn't choose for them to go out and play with the dog and play in the mud and stomp through puddles. But in order for it to all happen, it wasn't just about your choice. They had to comply with your choice. You see, God chooses for us and chose for us to be holy, but we have to choose to comply. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family. So there's a lot of people say, well, you know, I am the church because, you know, I'm saved and I trusted God. But God says the church is his family, his, his body that come together. It says don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together as some do. Right? He says you're adopted. It says his unchanging plan has always been to adopt us, not just us and him, but us together. Bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ, and this gave him great pleasure. So what is, what is God's plan for your life? The first thing to accept him to accept his salvation, to accept his choosing. How many of you ever known a family that adopts a child? And, and sometimes there's that place where the, the parents choose this child to adopt. And then, and then later, you know, during those, those fun years, then that child says, well, you never really wanted me. You're just stuck with me. And they go through that, that pity party, and then they, well, I'd rather have my real parents and not you. But, but you understand, we chose you. Now, how many of you, you understand that here, but then when it comes to God, you're not understanding that God chose you. Now, now how many of you... You know people. They're not, in, they're not in Hellendale. They're not in California. But you know people that they, they, they wanted kids really, really, really bad. And then when they got that kid, they were like, oh, my gosh, what were we thinking? Because honestly, I mean, it's just, like, it's just like with puppies. You know, sometimes you pick a puppy. Why do you pick them? Because they're cute. And then when they grow up, they ain't cute no more. 
right? And, 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 and the thing is, is when, when, when we have babies and we, we get puppies and whatever else it happens to be, we don't know what they're going to become or what they're going to be like. We're kind of going into it blindly, right? But here's the thing. God knew before you were ever created, God knew everything about you. He, did, he knew every stupid thing you'd say, every stupid thing you did, every disobedient act, everything that embarrassed not just your parents, but God too. He knew all of that. And, 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 and how many of you understand that right now you're being good because you're in church, but sometime this week you're going to do something stupid again because we're, we're all human and we all sin, right? And we all say the wrong things, right? But, 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 see, but see, before God chose you, he knew the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's, that's a big difference, isn't it? Because how many people are sitting right now at home saying, God won't love me anymore because of what I did. And yet, God knew you before you did it and chose you anyways and chose to die for you and chose to live for you and chose to accept you and chose to adopt you as his child. And he says our attitude should be that of dearly loved children. That, that, makes our, that makes our posture before God way different, doesn't it? We don't go to God hoping he's going to accept us. We don't go to God hoping he's going to love us because he's already done that. He can't love you anymore and he won't love you any less. He loves you with a perfect love, and he chose you knowing all your flaws. How many of you know somebody in another state that they, they um, fell in love, and they got into a marriage, and then they found out who the person really was and goes, oh, man. See, see God knew exactly who you were before he chose you. See, that makes grace a whole lot different. Doesn't it? And then when you go to him in prayer, that makes it a whole lot different. Being chosen is huge. God chose to love us. He chose to accept us. He chose to forgive us. It says, while we were his enemy, Christ died for us. He chose to adopt us. He, he chose to make it legal that we were legally his children. He chose to empower us. He chose to purchase our salvation. God chose all that, knowing how messed up we were. See, see you know the funny thing? Be honest with me. How many of you know that churches are full of quirky people? And, 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 and sometimes, man, being around Christians is like, it's difficult. And yet, and yet God chose us to bring us together. Knowing, I mean, think about it. Think about it. If, if, if you're a flawed person, which you are, and I'm a flawed person, and we see the problems in the church, how much more does, does God see it? And yet he still chose us to come together. And, and, and you know one of the greatest things of proving God and his existence is when we can love flawed people. And, and when we come to prayer, you know, you remember the, the Pharisee. Oh, God, I thank, I thank you. I'm not like them. I'm so much better than them. And then when them prayed, he said, I'm unworthy. I need you and I need your mercy. You see, 
You see, when we come, when we come with this knowledge, our posture before God is, you know, God, I'm not worthy, they're not worthy, we're not worthy, but, but God, you chose us. And, and you chose me. How many of you have tried to pray for somebody and you're like, God, God, I know they don't deserve it. And God, I, I know that, you know, this is going to be a stretch. But could you, could, you, could you help them? But see, the real attitude should be, God, I don't deserve to be talking to you right now, and yet you accept me. And they, and they don't deserve anything else, but that's what grace is. And so, and so, God, I ask for your grace and your mercy on me and them. You see, it changes our posture. And now when you're coming to God, how many of you, you, you you're kind of like, you went to church, and, and every week they'd have the tithing envelope, and on the envelope it had questions. Did you bring your Bible? Check. Did you come on time? Check. Did you bring a friend? Check. Did you witness this week? Check. And, 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 then, and then, so when you pray, when you pray, you're kind of conditioned. Okay, now God, God, I tithed this week, and, and I went to church twice this week, and, and I, I read my Bible this week, and, 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 and God, I have this request. Is, is, is that how we pray sometimes? God, because I've done all this stuff, I'm asking for this need to be met, um, would you meet it? And 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 God don't need that kind of anything, and he's not looking for that anything. He wants a person to come to him in faith and say, God, I don't deserve to talk to you. I don't deserve to exist in your presence, and, and God, you know my need before I come, but but because of our relationship and because you told me to, here's my need. And God, based on your grace and based on your mercy, and, and, and how do we pray? We pray in Jesus' name, don't we? Because we're saying, okay, God, don't take care of my need based on my track record. Base it on the authority of Jesus and his track record. Because, see, that's what grace is. Now, now how has your, your faith changed and how has your prayer changed if our attitude is, I don't have anything, and yet God says, come to me and talk to me. Talk to me about it. I know your need, and I'm willing to meet and supply all your needs. According to the riches and glory by Christ. And see, see, see now... Now my prayer has confidence. Because see, if I'm going to him saying, okay, God, I was really good this week. And hopefully last week didn't mess up how good I was this week, because I know I screwed up last week. Because then how's your prayer? It's like, well, you know, it could go either way. But if, if, our, if our prayer is based on God... Then we're going and we're saying, God, not about me. It's about you. It's about your perfect love. It's about your perfect grace. It's about your mercy. Now, now how's your confidence? See, you have more confidence because it's based on God and what he can do in spite of us and not based on what we can do. Does that make sense? This is huge. This could change our entire approach to prayer and our, our entire approach to life. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says, Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us from the beginning, and all things happened just as he decided long ago. Who's in charge of it all? God, in all the mess, in all the mess that I've made, in all the mess that we perpetuate, you're still in control. 
See, when you talk to God, you're talking about the person that's in control and at the end of the day in charge, whether we see it or not. But we, we believe it by faith. We receive it. Colossians 3.12, since God chose you to be holy, to be the holy people that he loves, you must, you must close your, clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So the word says that because God chose us to be his holy people, we must put on that holiness. How many of you, you remember those days when your kid was young enough, you would set out their clothes for them? And they matched? Right? And so, and so before they would wake up, you would put the clothes out, and you'd get it all ready for them so it was like a no-brainer. Right there. And then they'd come out looking like, you know, bozo or something. And you're like, uh... Uh, what happened? Those don't match. Yeah, but I like it. You see, you see, you gave them this perfect outfit that would make them look normal. But they had a choice to make. Right? They could either clothe themselves in, in, in the right stuff. And, and you're like, you know, those colors don't match. So they had a choice, and they can clothe themselves with what you chose for them, or they could look like that. And, and, and God says, you must, you must. It doesn't say you should. But you've got to clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy. Would that be a bad thing if we were all merciful people? Kindness. What would the world be like if Christians were actually kind? Humble. I don't even think our society knows what humble is anymore. Um, it's one of those lost words. But, but gentle and patient. What would, it like, what would it be like if Christians were patient people? You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you when you didn't deserve it. So you must forgive others when they don't deserve it. What's the number one thing that we think about when, when we have to forgive somebody? Well, they don't deserve it. They don't even mean it. They're just going to do it again. Right? Did God know that most of the time when you said, I'm sorry, you didn't mean it, and you were going to do it again, and he still forgave you? Right? And then it says, and, and, and the most important piece of clothing you must wear is love. Love is what binds us all together in perfect harmony. L love. Now let's look at prayer. See, we're 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 getting a we're getting a, a slow start. Romans ten nine and ten. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you're taking notes and when you're talking about prayer, you need to be taking notes. First word you need to put up there is who are you talking to? Lord. Lord. When, when, you're, when you're praying, you're not talking to an equal. You're talking to the guy in charge, right? And, and you're never going to be in charge. He's always been in charge, always is in charge, always will be in charge. When you got saved, you didn't go to somebody that was equal to you. You went to God, the Lord, and asked Him to save you. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that He's Lord that you are saved. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and all your soul and all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. So what's the first greatest commandment? You've got to love the Lord your God. So he's not your equal. He's not your best friend. He's the Lord God. All right? So he's the supreme being. So when you're praying, you're talking to the supreme being of the universe who is the ruler, the Lord, the ruler, the king. He's not the man upstairs. He's the God. Does that make sense? Huge difference. Who you talk to makes all the difference in the world. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on two things. Love God and love people. So all the rules, all the rules are based on loving God and loving people. But see, he's God. He's Lord. That means he's the supreme being. That means you couldn't exist without him. Nothing could exist without him. Remember, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Lord's command. Right? Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. Then God instructed the people as follows. I am the Lord, your God. The ruler that is God. He's not a man-made ruler. He's not a man-made king. He's God. All right? He says, who rescued you from slavery in Egypt. See, you didn't get yourself out of bondage and slavery. I, the Lord in charge, God, did it. Okay, it says, do not worship any other gods besides me. So we don't worship anything else or anyone else. We put God first and everything and everyone come below him. Make sense? Do not make idols of any kind, whether in the shape of birds or animals or fish. We don't pray to fish. We don't pray to dead people. We pray to God. All right? We're not going to establish anybody above him. I, I don't need anyone to take me to God. I go directly to God. Right? That's the principle that all of us have. That's what the scriptures tell us. It says you must never worship or bow down to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not share your affection with any other God. I do not leave unpunished the sins of those who hate me, um, but I punish the children of the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generations. Now, that seems pretty harsh, but what's he talking about hating? He's talking about anyone that puts anyone or anything else above him. But I lavish my love on those who love me and obey my commands even for a thousand generations. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. There's a whole lot of ways we misuse the name of the Lord our God. To say we're a believer and don't act like it is misusing his name. To constantly say his name over and over and over again like it's a cuss word. Or, 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 or like, you know, it's just a throw out word. Is to misuse his name. His name is as sacred as he is. His name is as holy as he is. We should respect the name of the Lord because it's representing the Lord. Does that make sense? It says the Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The Sabbath day, six days a week are set apart for your daily duties and regular work. But the seventh day is a day of rest. Now notice that day of rest is not um, um, boating and having fun. That day is dedicated to the Lord. We, we dedicate a day to the Lord. We, we dedicate it to the Lord. 
There's a lot of people say, you know, Pastor, I work, I work really hard, and so I can't come to church because I need that one day to rest. God says, D- dedicate a day of rest to the Lord. Now, see, that's interesting because why would we do that unless we're living by the principle that if we do what God says, it'll all work out? Right? Because he's the Lord. He's in charge. He's in control. Does, does that make sense? Amen. It, says, it says, on that day, no one in your household may do any kind of work. This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. So there's this overlying principle that one day a week we, we put it aside for God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them, and then he rested on the seventh day. Now here's the thing. Did God need to rest? God did not need to rest. He wasn't tired. He wasn't wore out. But he was showing us the principle. He was showing us the principle to rest. He says that's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. And the Lord set it apart as holy. Make sense? 1 Samuel 12, 12 says, But but when you were afraid of Nahash, the king of Ammon, um, you came to me and you said that you wanted a king to reign over you, even though the Lord your God was already your king. So what was the problem? We want to be like everyone else. We want to be like all the other nations. And God says, I don't want you to be like everyone else. I want you to let me be your God. Let me be your king. Don't have other kings. Just trust me. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8 says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And so I want you to consider this as a principle of prayer. It says, I saw the Lord. When you hear a lot of people's um, visions and dreams, and they saw the Lord, totally different from the pictures that we see in the Bible. But when I, Isaiah um, saw the Lord, he was given this vision of heaven, and this is how it went. God, the Lord, was sitting on a lofty throne. The size and the um, parameters of the throne uh, showed how important the king was. And his was big, and his was lofty, his was um, splendid. And it says, God was sitting on this lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And so in those days, the the length of the train, the robe that the king wore, the longer the train, the more powerful and the more mighty and the more important that king was. And it says his train wasn't just a foot or so. His train filled the entire temple. Because that's how important the Lord is. And so it's interesting, when he saw the Lord, the Lord was this powerful God, King, being that was better than anyone and anything else. And see, that's who we're praying to. Does that change your prayer life, just knowing that? Hovering around him were mighty seraphim, these mighty angelic beings, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with the remaining two they flew. And in a great chorus they sang, look at us and how beautiful we are. No, in a great chorus they sang, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And see, in, in, the, in the wording of the day in the Old Testament, holy was beyond us. But if you said, holy, holy, that's even further beyond us. And when you say, holy, 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 the emphasis is, he's infinitely above us. See, your God is not an equal. Your God is infinitely above you. Now, when you pray, you're talking to the God that said you could talk to him. He paid the price and made the way, and he's infinitely above you, and you don't deserve to be in his presence, but as, as, his, as his chosen child, he allows you to be there. 
The glorious singing shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire sanctuary was filled with smoke. And then I said, see, notice his attitude. And then I said, my destruction is sealed because I am not worthy to be in his presence. What what would it be like if our prayer life was, I don't deserve to be in the presence of God? Now, now finish the finish the illustration. He says, he says, I'm a sinful man and a member of a sinful race. He talks about he has unclean lips, right? Because he, he, he doesn't talk how he should. He says stuff he shouldn't. And it says, and yet, I've seen the king, the Lord Almighty. You see, the picture is, he's got the understanding. I don't deserve to be here, and yet here I am. So what do you do with that? And then he says, then one of the seraphim flew over to the altar and he picked up a burning coal with the pair of tongs. Okay, that's where I want out. All right? I'm seeing the Lord, that's all cool. I'm seeing the smoke, that's all cool. I'm seeing these cool angels. I'm hearing all this stuff, it's all cool. And then one of them gets a hot coal and starts coming toward me. All right, I'm out of here. Amen. Right? He touched my lips with the coal. Now, we would think that would be destruction. And yet, he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. And now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Wow. 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 So here you are, you come before the Lord, and when you come before the Lord, because you're really in the Lord's presence, you realize you got some sin in your life. And instead of destroying you, God says, if you'll confess your sins, admit your sins, then God will forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, how many understand, you know, that coal coming represents the the fire of God and the purifying power of God, but it's not the destroying power of God. And 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 how many of you, how many of you have you've been with the Lord and and you feel so bad about your sin, he might as well pour out the coals. And yet, and yet when you choose to confess it, then you come away feeling like you've never felt before. The sin has been lifted. The burden has been lifted. The fear, all that stuff has been lifted and you are forgiven. Now what does that do to your prayer life? See, there's a lot of people who say, well, I don't want to go to church because the roof's going to cave in. And, and, and I don't want to go down to the front because there are going to be lightning bolts. And I'm afraid to go to God because, you know, if I start, if I start telling him the stuff I did, he's not going to like me anymore. He knew the stuff you were going to do before you did it, and he still loved you, right? And, and he doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to purify you. He wants to make you holy. He wants to make you better. How many of you have ever had that conversation with a kid? You're like, I'm not trying to destroy your life. I'm trying to make your life better. I'm trying to make your future better. That's all God wants for us. Right? When we come to the Lord's Supper, do you realize the Lord chose the Passover? The Lord chose the supper. The Lord chose to come and invite his followers to the table. And and you realize none of them deserved it. Even even Goody Two-Shoes John, whom Jesus loved, didn't deserve to be there. Right? Come on, it's the truth. 
None of them deserve to be there. I mean, how many of you would have picked the disciples? Makes you realize who Jesus has to work with, right? And yet, and yet we come to the table, and what's the table about? God's judgment against sin and his love and forgiveness. Right? And, and, and when we come to the table, we come to the table, and we should see the Lord high and lifted up, exalted on his throne. And feel our unworthiness. And not stop there. But feel his acceptance. Right? See, communion should be a super special time where we come together and we say, Lord, we're, we're in your presence. We're coming to your table. We're coming to your meal. We're coming to your Passover. We're coming to your forgiveness. We don't deserve to be here, Lord. And, and Lord, we all need your grace.